I've read a lot of marketing books. Some are great, some are absolute garbage, and then there's this tier of where has this book been all my life? That's where this book falls into place. It's called Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. And if you own a business of any kind or you have a personal brand, this is going to be the most valuable video you click on all day. I guarantee it. So here's how it works. The goal of the book is to show you how to position your brand to your audience to get them to buy from you instead of your competitors. Now it sounds very simple, but very few companies do this correctly and it costs them a ton of money. So if you aren't following this step-by-step -step process, you are quite literally holding yourself back from creating the brand that you've always been dreaming of. And this all starts with this seven step story. What do I mean by this? Well, we're gonna dive into each step in the story and then use my own example of how I doubled my income this year by using it. Check this out. Step one, we have a hero. Every story starts with a hero. It can be Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, Katniss Everdeen, Buddy the Elf, it doesn't matter. But a lot of people get step one wrong by assuming that their brand or their company is the hero. It's not. The hero is your customer not you. Now, my hero is someone or some business trying to grow a brand on social media. You really want to define your hero, define your target audience. Who is your hero and what are they looking to achieve? And once you understand who your hero is, you know what trouble lies ahead for them because one day your hero is going to run into trouble. And that's where your story really starts. Step two, your hero has a problem and a problem in the story typically means a villain. Very good stories have a villain and the stronger and more evil the villain, the better the story. And this villain is trying to stop your hero from reaching their goals, completing their mission or transforming into a new and improved character. And what's interesting is the villain doesn't have to be a person but it should have human characteristics, right? Spider-Man has Doc Ock, Batman has the Joker. But if you look at companies like Mucinex, they have these little green monsters that run around your body when when you're sick. Now that's a bit of a dramatic jump there, but you get my point. So let's go back to the example of my hero and somebody trying to grow on social media, right? What problems do they have and what villains are in their way? So you might say to yourself, Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, and the people who run social media companies are holding my hero back from growing their brand. And that's true to a point, but let's think about this very broadly. What is something that everyone on social media has to deal with? What is the villain that everybody is trying to get past? Now it took me a bit to realize this, but the villain in my story is actually an algorithm. So it's this string of code written by some nerds out in Silicon Valley that everybody is trying to please. But in my story, I wanted to turn this string of code into a robot, just this little character that people can envision, right? Give it some human traits. Now villains cause a ton of problems and these problems fall into one of three categories. Now stick with me here because this is very important. Villains create external, internal, and philosophical problems. External problems are things like slow growth on Instagram, a low checking account balance, a bad credit score, or not selling enough of your product. So think of external problems as more surface level. Internal problems are more personal fears and frustrations that come from external problems. So if my hero experiences no growth on Instagram, they may feel like they're not good enough, they may feel like they're bad at making content, and that they're wasting their time. And then philosophical problems take that even one step further. So a philosophical problem can be talked about with words like ought or shouldn't. And this one worked really well for me, saying things like we shouldn't have to spend our time trying to please an algorithm to feel happy, like really hit home for a lot of people, including me, and I was the one who said it. <laughs> So your hero, aka your customer, is going to feel one of those three problems and it's your job to help them solve those problems. Now the big problem though, again, problem, is that companies try to sell solutions to external problems, but customers will always, always, always buy solutions to internal problems. So the brand that understands their customers' feelings the most is the brand that will win. And then this is the part of the story where you come in. So step three, your hero meets a guide. Every day people wake up with problems they don't know how to solve and they look for a guide to help. Now the guide is somebody who has already been there and done that, right? Luke Skywalker, for example, had Yoda. And if this picture right here looks familiar, that's Yoda, but it also has my face on it. So not to compare myself to Yoda, but the guide in my story was me. I've built a brand on social media. I've helped businesses around the country grow on social media and get past the feelings of being defeated by an algorithm. So now it's your turn to position yourself as the guide to your hero. Now guides typically have two characteristics and this is very important empathy and authority. And this is important because you can use these two things in your marketing material, right? Your hero is not just going to stumble upon you by accident. You need to pull these two levers to position yourself as the right guide among all the other guides out there because everybody else has this information too. So with empathy, 
there's really only one way to sum this up, right? People want three things. They want to be seen, they want to be heard, and they want to be understood. So your empathetic marketing material should sound like we understand that or nobody should have to experience dot, dot, dot. You're appealing to their internal problems by letting them know you understand how they feel through empathy. Now, the empathy in my story was things like, is anybody else tired of making content to please an algorithm? And yet again, that hit home with a lot of people. And just saying that in a sentence in a video on my Instagram story got that shared to a larger group of people who likely feel the same way. And that's where I position myself as the right guide among all of the other guides out there. I told my audience, I really understand what they're dealing with. And you also have authority, right? Authority comes down to a few things. There's testimonials, there's awards, and there's statistics. Now, testimonials, are the most effective in most cases, followed by awards and then followed by statistics. Let other people do the talking for you. One of my favorite quotes in this book is testimonials give potential customers the gift of going second. Three testimonials is a great number to start with. And so far in our story, we've met our hero, we understand the hero has a problem and we have positioned ourselves as the right guide to get the hero where they wanna be. But none of this will work without a plan. So step four is the guide gives the hero a plan. Customers trust a guide who has a plan. Simple as that. When somebody places an order on our website, they're basically saying, I believe you can help me solve my problems and I believe it so much that I'm willing to pay you my hard earned money. So think of this part of your story as identifying the path your customer needs to go on in order to get what they want. And I like to think of this as stones a customer can step on to walk across a creek. You're basically saying to them, first you step here, see, it's pretty easy. And then you step here and then you step here and then you'll be on the other side. Now these plans do one of two things, and don't worry, I'll show you how I put this on my online store. They either clarify how somebody can do business with us, or they remove the sense of risk that somebody might have if they're considering buying from us. So after every email we send, every time our website gets a click, every post we put on social media, our audience wonders the same thing. What do you want me to do now? And if we don't guide them, they get confused and they use that confusion as an excuse to not do business with us. So here's the easy fix, a process plan and an agreement plan. That's it. With a process plan, you outline the three to four steps that a customer needs to take in order to buy or use your product. It looks a little bit like this. Step one, you buy a membership. <laughs> Step two, you get an invite to your email for a private group and a link to a private video playlist. Step three, you learn how to grow your brand in just 10 minutes per day. That is the exact setup I use for my online store with my membership. And again, it's very simple, but it's very effective. Your customers should basically say to themselves, well, that seems pretty easy. I can do that. And then they click. But another type of plan works just as effectively, and that's the agreement plan. So if process plans are about getting rid of confusion in the buying process, the agreement plan is about getting rid of fear. So my agreement plan is designed to make people feel like their investment in my membership is worth it. I'm basically putting my money where my mouth is. And my agreement plan is this, if you're not happy, Step one, send me a DM in the private group. Step two, I will refund every penny you've ever paid within 12 hours. And step three, I will meet with you one-on-one -on -one to review all of your content and ensure you are happy before you leave. People think of any reason not to buy. Your plan should get rid of the confusion and the fear behind making a purchase and the plan should be as clear as possible. At this point in your story, your customers should hopefully be excited. <laughs> we know they have a problem. We've talked about their challenges. We have empathized with their feelings. We have explained that we are able to help them and we have given them a plan, right? But we need to do one more thing. We need to call our customers to action. And you're not gonna believe this, but we will ask them to place an order <laughs> in this step. And you'd be surprised how many of us are not asking for the sale or doing it enough. Now, there are two kinds of call to actions here, right? There are directional and transitional. Now, think of your relationship with your customers truly as a relationship. Your transitional call to action is like asking them on a date where the direct call to action is like asking them to marry you, right? It's gonna be bumpy and you won't get married right away, and that looks a little bit like this. So us, will you marry me? Customer, no. Us, will you go out with me? Customer, sure. Us, do you wanna get married? Customer, no, still no. Us, should we go on another date? Customer, yeah, I guess. You're pretty cool and you've been helpful to me. Sure, us, all right. After that date, can we get married? Customer then says, sure. 
So I like to think of my transitional content as free educational products that anybody can download. I want to get these people who are somewhat interested in my offer into my ecosystem. And then from there, we can keep on dating. Every week, I'll give them something extra, something educational that they can use to get results. And then I won't expect anything in return, at least not for now or initially. So on my online store, I have a full crash course video on how to get videos to rank number one on Google and YouTube. And guess what? It's totally free. So anyone who downloads it, they give me their email, and then they receive weekly emails from me with even more marketing tips. It's all transitional. And then once they're ready to buy, all of my marketing content has a clear direct call to action, become a member or buy now, where they can go and they can buy my products, get married. So the key here is to make your call to action very clear. There should be no fluff. There should be no confusion. Your customers should at any given time know exactly what you want them to do. And because we've outlined all of these steps they need to make in order to get what they're looking for, it will be much easier for them to click buy. But at this point, we have only identified what customers will get if they buy. We haven't gone through what they will miss out on if they don't buy, or even a step further, what pain they'll experience by not buying. So step six is something that helps them avoid failure. So your blog content, your email content, and the bullet points on your website, and the bio on social media, and your captions on social media should include these elements of potential failure to give your customers a sense of urgency. Now, the easiest way to do this is in four steps. Step one, we need to make the person know that they are vulnerable, vulnerable <laughs> to a threat, right? So you could say something like nearly 60% of content creators stop making content because of mental health setbacks. Step two, we should let them know that since they are vulnerable, <laughs> they should take action to reduce that vulnerability. So you could say something like, nobody should have to deal with mental health consequences of social media. You should do something about it to protect yourself. Step three, we should inform them about a specific call to action that protects them from that risk. So in my case, I said, I offer a mental health and marketing group for content creators just like yourself to ensure that you have the help you need and the motivation you need to not give up. And then step four, we should challenge people to take this specific action. Very clear, no fluff, very direct. Click here to purchase access to the group. So really ask yourself here, what negative consequences are you helping your customers avoid? Could they lose money? Do they become vulnerable to health risks? And what is the cost of not doing business with you? And once we define what is at stake, your customer will be more motivated not to experience failure. But then there's one more step <laughs> to increase the motivation behind purchasing, which is helping them imagine what life can look like when they buy your product. And this brings us to step seven. The story ends in success. So remember, people want to be taken somewhere. They wanna go from where they are right now to a life they've been dreaming about. And they need to know that your brand is what is going to get them there. So we need to tell our customers what their lives will look like after they buy our products. Otherwise, they're never gonna be motivated enough to buy our product. Never gonna be, <laughs> it's a tongue twister. Now there are three dominant ways you can end your story. So the first is by having your hero win some sort of power or position. The second is having your hero connect with somebody or something that makes them whole. And the third is by your hero experiencing some kind of self-realization that also makes them whole. So for power and position, you could offer access to a membership that frequently gives your customers access to free stuff. So American Express does this with its airport lounges and Twitch does this with its memberships to content creators with a special badge. Now for the connection with somebody or something to make your hero whole, you can think about this as a product that reduces anxiety, reduces workload, or saving a customer time. Perfect example of this is smoke detectors that reduce anxiety of people who are afraid of or no, dying <laughs> in a fire, right? And one of the best examples of self-realization and acceptance is American Eagle's brand, Aerie. And this actually uses real people as models and refuses to Photoshop any of the pictures. So in my story, I give customers access to a private group called Gannon's Gannon's. They get private lessons from me, the occasional free coffee, and a community that supports them when they inevitably feel like giving up on social media. Now, the idea is to keep telling your customers how your product makes their lives better. They will not buy from us if we don't tell them where we are taking them. So we've met our hero. Our hero had a problem. They met us as the guide. We gave them a plan. We called them to action. 
we help them avoid failure, and we led them to success. Those are the seven steps of telling your story to your customers. And if you enjoyed this video, consider grabbing the book. It's not mine. I'm not paid to promote this, but it's a great book. And of course, consider becoming a Canon where you'll get exclusive access to private videos just like this to build the brand that you've been dreaming about. Appreciate you being here. Catch you in the next one. Peace.